okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, reading in verse 1, let's talk about more and more pure. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we've already told you and warned you, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives us the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, yours alone are the words of eternal life. The things you've told us are so that your joy might be in us and our joy might be complete. Father, I pray that you'd give us grace today to receive your word. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our minds to comprehend, our hearts to accept. Come, Holy Spirit, convict us that God's way is right and convince us that God's love is ours. Cleanse, consecrate, recreate us in the mighty name of Jesus. If your heart agrees, say amen and amen. Christian, God's will for you is a lifelong journey that leads to more and more sexual purity. There was a little boy who was riding along in the car with his dad one day, and he asked the question, Dad, where did I come from? The dad's heart started to race a little bit. He knew that eventually this moment would come, but he didn't expect it at all so soon. He took a deep breath and he launched into a long, convoluted, awkward explanation of the Garden of Eden and the difference between men and women's bodies and love and romance and marriage and the birds and the bees. When he was finished, there was a long pause and the boy sat there looking very puzzled. The father said, did I answer your question, son? And the little boy said, not really. The new kid next door said he came from Philadelphia. I was just wondering where I came from. <laughs> Today we're going to have a little talk about a very mature subject. A few weeks ago, we opened the very first letter ever written by Paul. It was addressed to the new Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica. We've been reading the lines of this letter, listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through them. You see, the letters of the New Testament are no ordinary letters. They are letters from heaven. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to Christ followers everywhere in every generation. The first eight verses of 1 Thessalonians 4 deal are, are the most personal lines in this letter. They deal with our sexuality. They deal with our sexual attitudes and our behaviors. And Paul is talking to us like a dad. He's passing down the heavenly wisdom he received from our Father above. Paul eases into this delicate subject by first reminding us what is the goal of our life as Christ followers, and that is to please God. Paul says, when we were with you, we instructed you how to live to please God. Beloved, as Christians, that's our first objective. That's our first priority, the primary focus of our life, not to please ourselves, but to please Him, not to do as we please, but to do only what pleases Him. Paul wrote, so we make it our goal to please Him as long as we're alive. We live to please Him because we love Him. 
You know, when you're in love with someone, you just instinctively do what you know will please his heart or her heart. You're very careful. You're very attentive. You're very attuned. You never want to hurt or disappoint or neglect. You always want to express care and desire and honor. And it's the same with God. Because we love him, we live to please him. We also live to please him because he is God. Pleasing Him is what we were created expressly to do. It's what we're made for. It's what He made us for. It only makes sense that we should live to please our Creator, our Father, our King. We owe Him that. We also live to please Him because He blesses those who please Him. Solomon said to the man that pleases God, He gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the burden of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the man who pleases God. Solomon also said, God causes the hearts of kings to have favor on those who please him. Jesus said, my father has never left me alone because I always do what pleases him. John said, we have this confidence that we will receive from God whatever we ask because we do what pleases him. What are some of the blessings of pleasing him? Wisdom, know-how for every part of our life, happiness, transferred wealth, favor with powerful and influential people, the abiding presence of God and answered prayer. How many of you think it's a good idea to please God? As Paul eases into this subject of sexuality, he reminds us not only that our goal is to please God, but he also reminds us of the nature of our Christian experience. It is a journey into more and more of Jesus. You know, the King James Bible actually uses the right word here that describes our Christian life. It's a walk. It's a trip. It's a journey. All along the way, we experience more and more of the saving power of the cross. We experience more and more grace, more and more freedom, more and more goodness, more and more fullness of the Spirit. The Thessalonians had a really good start. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but Paul told them, you still need more. He wrote, I long to come to you so that I can supply what your faith is yet lacking. You've had a good start, but you still need more. You still need more revelation. You still need more apostolic teaching. You still need more prophetic input. You still need more pastoral instruction and correction. You still need more discipleship and mentoring. You still need more faith, more love, more strength in your heart. Beloved, don't ever forget that our Christian experience is designed by God to be one of more and more. Faith to faith, strength to strength, and glory to glory. And if you ever reach the place where you don't believe you need more, or you really just don't feel that you're one anymore, I want to tell you that's a dangerous place to be. What is the goal of our life as Christ followers to please him? What is the nature of our Christian experience more and more? With that in mind, Paul takes a deep breath and he plunges into a very delicate subject. He says, God's will for you is a lifelong journey that leads to more and more sexual purity. Why is our sexual purity so important to God? For one thing, Paul says, it's because we have been called to something far better than impurity. He wrote, God didn't call us to be sexually impure, but to live a holy life. Do you know the default setting of unbelievers is sexual obsession, perversion, and dysfunction. Paul says, don't be controlled by runaway lust like the heathens who do not know God. Can I tell you that not a lot has changed in 2,000 years of history? You know, the attitudes about sex in Thessalonica were very similar to our attitudes in America today. Abstinence from sex was considered an unreasonable demand on an unmarried man. 
Sexual fidelity in marriage was also considered unreasonable. Sex outside of marriage was not only tolerated, it was celebrated and it was promoted. In fact, sex with prostitutes was part of the worship in Greek temples. They had no attendance problems in the Greek temples. A couple of centuries before Paul, Demosthenes of Athens wrote this, Mistresses we keep for our pleasure, prostitutes for our day-to-day -day physical well-being, and wives we keep to bear us legitimate children. You know, we might not put it out there quite so bluntly, but the truth is expectations today are for all kinds of sexual activity outside of the sacred covenant of marriage. Preteens and teens are expected to explore sexually. In fact, they are encouraged to do so in public schools. Young adults are expected to be sexually active before marriage. Abstinence is considered an unreasonable demand. Couples are expected to live together before marriage. Do you know that over half do today? Did you know that living together before marriage increases the likelihood of divorce by 40%? Unless you know Jesus. Babies are expected to be born outside of wedlock. More than half are. Married people are expected to gratify themselves by other means than just intimacy with their spouses. This is a picture of Olympic gold medalist David Wise. He's a 23-year-old snowboarder. There was a news story floating around about him this week published by NBC News. The headline was, David Wise's alternative lifestyle leads to Olympic gold. David Wise is married with a little baby girl, and he and his wife are youth leaders at an Assemblies of God church in Reno, Nevada. That's the alternative lifestyle. So it has now become a novelty for a young man to be married, start a family, and be active in his church instead of tomcatting around like the other snowboarders. See, that's where our expectations are. But Jesus said, God has designed something far better for us than that. Jesus said, haven't you read that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And He said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one for God has joined them together. Beloved, there is something better than the sexual obsessions and perversions of unbelievers. It's the spiritual union called one flesh that exists between a man and a woman in the sacred covenant of marriage. Did you know that sex was completely God's idea? God came up with that all on his own. Think about it. God could have made any means of procreation. A handshake, a sneeze, that's you, oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> Swapping gum, hey, baby, let's start a family. <laughs> but God didn't do that. God designed male parts that correspond with female parts, and he made female parts that correspond with male parts, and he designed them to come together in a union that is pleasurable and productive and fulfilling. Thank you, Jesus. When a husband and a wife physically join their bodies together, God creates the strongest bond that can possibly exist between two people on earth. Jesus said God joins them together. God superglues them together. He welds them together. In that moment, the husband and wife connect spiritually and emotionally as well as physically and pleasurably. The one flesh bond in marriage is spiritual and mysterious. The New Testament says it's a little taste of heaven on earth. It is an earthly glimpse of the unity that exists within the Godhead itself and the unity that now exists between us and Jesus Christ as believers. The one flesh bond extends far beyond the moment of intercourse. 
a husband and flesh are one uh, a husband and wife excuse me are one flesh while they're being physically intimate and they remain one flesh when they're apart you and your spouse are one flesh while you're working you're one flesh while you're working out. You're one flesh while you're traveling on business. You're one flesh while you're shopping. You're one flesh while you're paying the bills. Husbands, remember that when you're going through the credit card statement. You're one flesh. <laughs> you're one flesh when you're playing with the kids. You're one flesh when you're fighting. So take it easy when you fight. Don't beat yourself up. And the result of that one flesh bond is a connectedness and a contentedness that creates within us an abiding sense of well-being. You feel secure and significant. You feel lovable and lovely and loved. You feel confident. You feel fulfilled. And every time a husband and wife are intimate again, that bond is renewed and strengthened and deepened. You know, that's why the devil will do everything in his power to persuade you to have sex before you're married, and then he'll do everything in his power to prevent you from having sex after you're married because he wants to undermine the godly solidarity that exists in the one flesh bond of marriage. That's really good preaching right there. All right, how you doing so far? You all right? I'm going to give you a little lemonade when this is over, okay? Because it's going to get even more dicey, so just hold on for a little bit. Listen now. God only supernaturally joins a man and a woman together within the sacred covenant of marriage. God will not supernaturally glue a hookup. God will not supernaturally glue a dating couple. He will not supernaturally glue a cohabitating couple. Don't try and reason away obedience to the word of God by telling me how much you love each other or how deeply committed you are to one another. Baloney, God requires the commitment of a marriage covenant. Yeah. Neither will God supernaturally glue together a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Beloved, people might join their bodies together, but outside of marriage, God won't grant them the blessing of that one flesh bond that is fulfilling and security building and soul satisfying. Hebrews says the marriage bed is blessed and undefiled in everything, but God will judge all the sexually immoral. If two people join their bodies together without God's one flesh blessing, the result is just the opposite of what God intended sex to create. There's still physical pleasure. There might be procreation, unwanted or unexpected. But instead of that wonderful emotional connection that God designed, sex outside of the covenant of marriage separates people. It pushes them towards isolation and leads to insecurity, loss of confidence, regret. It leads unavoidably to shame. It leads to resentment, anger, even animosity for the person that you were intimate with. You see, the thing about sex is that it is not just physical, it is spiritual. Jesus said so. And God designed it so that it only works within the parameters of marriage. If you violate that, you create confusion. You create confusion in your own spirit. You know, Paul says, in fact, there is a spiritual transaction that happens among violators, but it's an unholy one. You create confusion in your own soul, in your own body, and you create confusion in the lives of others. And that brings us to the second reason why our sexual purity is so important to God. It's because, secondly, our sexual impurity robs others. Paul says in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or sister or take advantage of him or her. Beloved, may God give you grace to receive the truth of his word. Listen, sexual impurity not only shortchanges yourself, but it also robs others. Paul says it is God's will that you should avoid impurity. 
That word for impurity is the Greek word porneia. We get pornography from that word. Porneia is an umbrella term for a whole range of sexual behaviors. Lust, fed by pornography, fantasy, self-gratification. Fornication is sex between unmarried people. Adultery is sex outside of the marriage covenant. Affairs, sex with prostitutes, homosexual acts, bestiality. If you are unmarried, porneia robs future spouses and families. It undermines the foundation of your future marriage by defiling you and enslaving you. It diminishes your ability to enjoy true intimacy with your future spouse. It pushes you towards isolation. If you're sexually involved with someone, you're robbing her today and you're robbing her future spouse tomorrow. If you're married, porneia robs everybody. Your spouse, your kids, your parents, her parents, your circle of friends. If you're involved with someone, it robs everyone connected to that other person. Porneia robs children. Half, listen to me, half the children in America today are growing up without dads. Among some minority communities, it is over 75% of kids are growing up without fathers in their life. Can I tell you that the root cause of just about every social plague in America today is fatherlessness. And the root cause of fatherlessness is porneia. In the spiritual realm, porneia plants seeds of iniquity into the hearts of our children that bears ugly fruit, not only in our kids, but in their kids, and down the line if Jesus tarries. Porneia exploits the weakness and brokenness of young women and young men who get lured into the porn industry and the sex trades. If you are a consumer at any level, you are complicit. Pornea is the gift that just keeps taking and taking and taking and taking. There was once a young man named Amnon who was lovesick for a beautiful girl named Tamar. Turns out that his love sickness, so called, was really nothing more than pure selfishness, runaway lust that was fueled by fantasy. See, that's the nature of porneia. It just takes control of your whole life. It leads to addiction and dysfunction. Amnon's cousin, John, came up with a plan for him to get what he wanted using some of the oldest plays in the book. Invite her over for dinner. Play upon her sympathies. Make her vulnerable. And then at the right moment, take advantage of her weakness. Amnon followed John's advice, and it worked like a charm. Tamar begged him to do things the right way. She begged him to stop pressuring her. She begged him to wait until they were married. But in the end, Amnon overpowered her will, and he stole her virginity away from her. Solomon said, three things amaze me, but the fourth blows my mind. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a virgin. After Amnon took what he wanted, something all too familiar happened. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 13. It says, Then Amnon hated her with an intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had previously loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He threw her out and bolted the door. Tamar put ashes on her head. She tore the beautiful dress she was wearing. She put her hand over her face and she went away weeping loudly. And she lived at her brother's house, desolate and disgraced. Beloved, our sexual impurity robs others without exception. J.B. Phillips said, you cannot break this rule without in some way defrauding your fellow man. And that brings us to the third reason why our sexual purity is so important to God. It's because God will judge us for robbing others. Paul said, in this matter, no one should take advantage of his brother or sister 
or wrong them because Jesus will punish men for all such sins. You know, while I was studying the scriptures this week, I saw sexual purity from a perspective that I never noticed before. Our roots are in the Pentecostal holiness movement. And if you understand those roots, I grew up accustomed to thinking about holiness in terms of not being like the world. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The world does this, so we'll do that. The world does that, so we'll do this. But listen, I, I've realized that there is a far better way to think about holiness. See if you can track with me on this. This took me 47 years. It took me eight years of theological education and 20 years of exegesis to get this, so don't miss it this morning. The goal of holiness is not to be unlike the world. The goal of holiness is to be like Jesus. See, our objective is not to be different from them. It's to be like him. The focus of holiness isn't their waywardness, but his goodness. Jesus is the object, not the world. So let's stop fretting over how dirty they are. And let's celebrate how beautiful and pure Jesus is and strive to become like that. Beloved, listen to me. God's commands are not merely a list of rules for us to keep. God's commands are a revelation of him. They reveal the beautiful, pure, holy nature of God. They reveal the goodness of God. This is how God behaves. This is how God conducts himself. This is how God treats other people. The beautiful life of Jesus was the embodiment of all the righteousness in the commands of Scripture. And God's commands regarding our sexual purity reflect how God is himself. He is the God of covenant relationship. He is enduringly faithful. He is loyal to a fault, if that were possible. He values honest, transparent, unobstructed intercourse. He is a selfless lover. He always seeks our good. God never uses people. God never defrauds people. He never exploits people. God never robs people. And he will punish all those who do. Beloved, can I tell you it's imperative that we do not disregard God's call to sexual purity. Paul said this is God's will for you. Jesus said not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father. You see, to disregard God's call to purity is to live as if God doesn't matter. Paul said, we've given you these instructions by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, he who rejects these instructions does not reject men, but God. That word for reject means to nullify a last will and testament. It means to nullify a legal contract. He who rejects this instruction nullifies God. As if God doesn't see as if God doesn't hear, as if God doesn't know, as if God doesn't act. For believers to reject God's call to sexual purity is to sin against the Holy Spirit. Paul said, he who rejects this instruction nullifies God who keeps giving us the Holy Spirit. You see, God is so good to us that he continually offers the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome temptation and live pure. But if we're living in willful disobedience to God's words, then God keeps offering us the Holy Spirit and we keep saying, no thanks. And he offers the Holy Spirit again and we say, no thanks. And he offers the Holy Spirit again and we say, no thanks, no thanks. Beloved, can I tell you, that we're treating far too lightly what God has said in his word is deadly serious. How many believers nowadays do whatever they please and then say, it's okay, God knows my heart. On Wednesday nights, we're studying 
letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation, you know, every one of those letters begins with the words, I know your works. Turns out Jesus doesn't evaluate us based on our sentimentalities. Jesus evaluates us based on the practical outworking of our faith and our daily lives. That's great preaching right there. (laughs) Paul said, don't kid yourself. Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither the sexually immoral, there's that word porneo again, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. That's what some of you were. But now you're washed. Now you're sanctified. Now you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Beloved, don't make a mistake. Sexual purity is a life and death matter. But I want to say to you, these lines aren't written to scare us to death. They're written to encourage every one of us to keep going on our journey. God's will for you is a lifelong journey that leads to more and more sexual purity. God's will for you is a process that leads to becoming more and more like him. The word that Paul uses here in 1 Thessalonians 4 for sanctification means a process that leads me towards that final state of holiness. You see, day by day by day, as I walk it out, as I walk it out, as I walk it out, I am experiencing more and more of the reality of my new identity in Christ. When I was eight years old and I laid on my bed and I asked Jesus to come into my heart, at that moment Jesus made a declaration about me. He said, you are now this. This is what God called me, but experientially it wasn't what I was yet. And now every day I'm climbing higher. Every day I'm moving further. Every day I'm becoming more and more and more like him. So the worst is over now, all right? Now we get good. Whether married or unmarried, whether you're just starting out on your journey in Jesus or whether you're well on your way, how can we walk in more and more purity? I want to give you three words very quickly before we close today. Three words. How can we walk in more and more purity? First of all, avoid. Avoid. It is God's will that you should avoid porneia, sexual impurity. You know, when I really looked at that again, I began to get very encouraged because I realized that all of us are already masters at avoidance. It's true. If there is someone that we do not want to see, we know exactly where not to go so that we don't bump into that person. If there is a call that we don't want to take, we know exactly how to dodge that call. Oh, sorry, I missed your call. You liar. You didn't miss it. You dodged the phone call. (laughs) If there's a conversation we don't want to have, we know exactly how to change the subject to avoid having that conversation. Listen to me. If avoidance was an Olympic sport, every one of us in this room would be a gold medalist. So what if we applied those avoidance skills that we've already developed to the pursuit of purity in our lives? Paul said, flee sexual immorality. Avoid the people. Avoid the places. Avoid the scenarios in which you are likely to become tempted. We have our Pathways ministry that meets on Tuesday evening, and the Pathway leaders taught me one of the most helpful things that I've ever learned about avoiding temptation. It's called change a thought, move a muscle. See, we're already masters at changing the subject. If we don't want to discuss something, we can do the same thing. If our thoughts are carrying us down a pathway that leads to temptation, we can just change the subject, change the thought, and then get up and move a muscle. Go wash the dishes that are in your sink. Go make your bed. Go back in the house. Go do something that will take your mind off of that thing you're dwelling on. Jesus took that counsel of avoidance and he took it up to another level. Jesus always lifts the conversation to another level. 
Regarding lust, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Now everybody look at me. That was hyperbole, all right? Do not go and pluck out your eye or cut off. I don't want to come to Greenwich Hospital this afternoon. I have a membership class of five. I don't have time to go do restorative healing miracles, okay? Don't pluck out your eye. Don't cut off your hand. What Jesus is trying to say to us through those words is take decisive action to put a stop to runaway lust in your life. Do whatever you have to do. Cut off whatever associations you have to cut off. Burn any bridges you have to burn. Unplug whatever you have to unplug. Toss whatever you have to toss. Listen, when we do that, when we destroy those items and connections that have kept us bound to impurity, that is an act of repentance that causes the grace of God's forgiveness to flow in our life, and it causes restoration and healing. How can we walk in more and more purity? Number one, avoid. Number two, learn. The second word is learn. Each of you, Paul says, should learn how to control your own body in a way that's holy and honorable. There's a lot to say here, more than I have time to say, but let me just give you a couple of quick things. First of all, I want to say to our married couples, the second best defense against sexual impurity is a strong marriage. Verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians 4 has a very interesting history. Some interpreters understand this verse to read, each of you should learn how to possess his own wife. The idea is that each of you should learn to keep on cultivating your marriage relationship. Each of you should learn how to keep on cultivating the favor of your life. Keep dating, keep romancing your wife, keep growing in your marriage bond with her. That is probably not the correct translation, but it is good preaching. See, the one flesh bond is one of the best defenses against sexual impurity. So husbands, listen to me. Invest in your marriage. Strengthen your marriage. Improve your sex life. Work on it. You have my blessing. Deepen the one flesh bond that exists between you. Husbands, let me give you a couple things from the Lord. First of all, if you had sex with your wife before marriage... If you lived together before marriage, if you haven't done this already, take your wife aside in a quiet moment and ask her to forgive you for not leading your family properly and in alignment with the word of God. If you haven't done this already, ask your wife to kneel beside the bed with you. Confess your sin to the Lord and ask God to forgive you. I don't care if it was five years ago or 15 years ago or 25 years ago. If you haven't done it, do that and watch what God does to restore the beautiful one flesh bond between you. The second thing I want to say to husbands is go to bed at the same time as your wife. Go to bed together. Pray with your wife. Listen, you don't have to pray like John Wesley. Just say a prayer. <laughs> Talk to your wife. Hold your wife. Guys, don't stay up at night watching television or stay up on the Internet. And wives, let me say to you, you cooperate in this too. Oh, but Pastor Glenn, I'm a night owl. Become a day owl. If it means changing your daily routines to do it, I want to tell you that the payoff is well worth the investment. Learn to control your own body. For everyone, whether married or unmarried, use all the growth resources that God has given you in the body of Christ. The best defense against sexual impurity is to be growing in your walk in Christ. We have so many ministries right here at Harvest Time that can help you grow more and more pure. We have a men's discipleship group that meets on Monday evenings called Clean that especially addresses these issues. Men meet for prayer here at the building early, several mornings a week. Pathways Ministry on Tuesday evening has groups for men and groups for women that are specifically designed to help you be an overcomer. Gift is our women's mentoring program. 
girls in faith training. We're going to start a men's mentoring program. We might call it MIFT, Gift and MIFT. Come to study the Bible on Wednesday evenings. Come to Sunday school class in the dome on Sunday morning. Listen, the Word of God transforms your mind, and it doesn't really matter what portion of Scripture you're studying. doesn't matter what subject you're studying out of the Bible. doesn't have to be sexual purity. It can be anything the Bible talks about, but the Word of God will scrub your mind clean. Cleansing Stream course is getting ready to begin again in just a, a couple of weeks. The Cleansing Stream retreat is coming up. If you've never been through that class, it's one of the most powerful things that we do here at Harvest Time. And part of the time we uh, address these issues in prayer and repentance, deliverance prayer is available for our members. We have a new ministry coming online in March to help couples strengthen their marriages. Denise and I were away on a marriage retreat together last weekend that was absolutely special spectacular and we're making that retreat available to every all the married couples in the church coming up in the month of June we have a singles retreat coming up with Matt Sorger use all of these resources we're blessed we have many Christian counselors here in our church body they will meet with you they will help you listen to me don't stay stuck in impurity come see one of the pastors men come see me come see pastor nick come see pastor steve ladies there's pastor faith there's pastor ruth there's pastor karen there's pastor uh kevin for teenagers we have women who work with our teenage girls there's pastor bobby for college age students we got pastors coming out of our ears around here and we will We'll meet with you and we will help you take a step forward on your journey in Jesus Christ. How can we walk more and more pure? Res worship team, come rescue me, please. Avoid, second word learn. The last word I'm going to give you is the word take. Take the help that God keeps offering and offering and offering to you. Jesus said not everyone will marry. Let me tell you something, teenagers. Let me tell you something, young adults. Do you know that the vast majority of young adults under the age of 30 say that they never want to get married? You have no idea of the blessing that you're robbing yourself and you're robbing the world if you never open your heart to enter that beautiful, listen, young men, make something of yourself. Get a, get a career, get a job so you can support a wife, support a family, become the man that God wants you to become so that you can care and love on a wife. You don't want to rob yourself of the beautiful blessing of marriage. Ladies, keep yourselves pure. Hey, keep yourselves focused on pleasing Jesus. Uh, don't miss out. Young, young adults, teenagers, don't miss out on the beautiful blessing of marriage. Our culture is lying to you. They are lying through your teeth. There is no nothing there in what they're offering you. Jesus said not everyone will marry. Not everyone will remain married. But so long as you're unmarried, the only God-pleasing option is abstinence. Beloved God never changes. His word never changes despite the shifting sands of human culture. Neither has God's design for sex within the covenant of marriage changed. Abstinence outside of marriage is not old-fashioned. It is God-fashioned, and God is always in style. And God's rules are not cruel. They're not unreasonable demands on us. They're a call for us to be like Him. God is a spirit. But he took on a human nature. He took on a body of human flesh. Jesus became fully a man in every regard. He was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Jesus was abstinent and sexually pure. And whatever God commands us to do, he always, always, always helps us to do. Can I tell you, God just doesn't give us a, 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 a book and points on a compass and then pat us on the back and say, good luck on your journey. God is with us to help us every step of the way. 
as we journey towards more and more sexual purity, we're helped by the intercession of Jesus, our great high priest who empathizes and sympathizes completely with every point of our human weakness. What difference would it make if just for a moment this morning, God would pull back the veil between heaven and earth and you could hear Jesus, your high priest, interceding for you? What if God pulled back that veil and you could hear the voice of Jesus poured out in prayer? God, strengthen him today. God, surround him today. Father, protect him today. Father, just pour into him everything he needs today. Father, order his steps today. What difference would it make if you could hear Jesus praying for you? Because he is. God helps us not only with the intercession of Jesus, but can, by continuously giving us the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Bible says the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts. This is true for all of us, but especially for the unmarried people. Let me just say, the Holy Spirit pours God's love into your heart that fulfills you, that makes you feel significant, that makes you feel loved and secure and complete and confident, even if sexual intimacy is not part of your experience right now. The Holy Spirit administers the peace of Jesus, the shalom of Jesus. That means that there's nothing missing and nothing broken. The Holy Spirit administers to men perfect masculinity and to women perfect femininity. And the Holy Spirit also strengthens us inwardly. He strengthens our emotions. He strengthens our thoughts. He strengthens our will so that we're determined and we make decisions that always please Him. God's will for your life, Christian, is a lifelong journey that leads toward more and more purity. Avoid what's impure. Learn how to control your body and take the help that God is offering you. May God give you grace to receive His Word. Would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord?